All right, just a reminder, this is a previous sermon of pastors. So when it says I, obviously, it is him talking. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you the bread recipe that has been handed down in the family for at least three generations. It's the most amazing white bread I have ever tasted. Here's how you do it. Shortening, water, pinch of salt, a little sugar, yeast, flour until it feels right. Mix together, let rise, and bake in a hot oven. Now, I'd like to see a show of hands. If I were to print this out and give this recipe to all of you, how many of you could make this bread? There's no amounts given anywhere, no instructions on order, not even a temperature setting for the oven. So I'm guessing that most of you couldn't make this one happen. I'll also tell you that this is one of my favorites, not only because of what it makes, but because of the way it describes a miracle. Stay with me on this one. Somewhere between the dry goods on the counter and the mixing and the rising and the baking, those ingredients are transformed. They become more than the sum of their parts. And it happens in ways that transcend simple instructions. As it bakes, you can smell the transformation. The delicate, subtle aroma sifts through the oven door and fills the room with what can only be described as heaven. And then the baker slices the bread off the racks and onto the hot pad, and the first cut is made. And then the butter melts into the steaming pieces. And you put in your mouth to experience nothing short of a miracle. I mean, think of it. How can flour, water, sugar, shortening salt, and yeast be transformed into this? How did we get from this list, list of dry ingredients and a few cryptic instructions to this amazing meal that can only be experienced? I thought about this as I thought about today's gospel lesson. I've noticed that on the one hand, when it comes to life, we religious people are fond of recipes. We like simple answers to our problems, easy explanations on why things happen the way they do. On the other hand, we are rarely afforded such luxury. Our world, world is a little too big for such simplicities. Like the mysterious transformation from recipe to bread, something happens in life that defies explanation. So while we religious people would like a recipe kind of world, religion itself is more a mystery, more like a riddle that's designed to carefully conceal explanations so that we have the answer, but at the same time, we don't. For instance, when Moses is called by God to go to Egypt and set free the Israelites, Moses sees God in the form of a bush that is burning. But the flame does not consume the bush. How can that be? A burning bush that isn't? Moses wants it simple, but God is bigger than a recipe. And then, same story, Moses asks God for his name. God says, tell them that I am sent you. I am who I am. Again, Moses wants it simple, but God is bigger than a recipe. Now read the Gospel of John. John goes to describe Jesus, and he does it with the same religious word plays. His Gospel is full of them. Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about being born from above. Nicodemus wonders, how will he send his mother back into pregnancy? Or the lesson about the woman at the well. Jesus speaks of living water, and the woman reminds him that the well is deep and he has no bucket. Or in chapter 6, Jesus speaks of heaven, that once eaten will always satisfy hunger. But everyone thinks Jesus is talking about buttertop. In all these stories, Jesus speaks of common things. 
Yet, like ingredients in a recipe, the end product has an element of mystery to it. Hidden in very ordinary things is a reality that defies explanation. So we turn to chapter 9, and we get more of the same. Jesus heals a man who was blind from birth. He puts mud in the blind man's eyes so that he might see. In comes the religious folks, the recipe types. None of them are sinful. They have been able to see since birth. They know of the miracle, and they want to understand what has happened. They're not content with the smell of the bread in the oven. It's not enough to taste that miraculous transformation. They want a connect the dots recipe so that for every life struggle, there is a logical explanation. They know that since the blind man was born this way, someone is responsible for the problem. And this blindness is a punishment from God. Who then has sinned, Jesus, him or his parents? What's the recipe? How did it happen? But of course, all Jesus gives them is a few ingredients and a loaf in the oven. His blindness, says Jesus, is so that we might see the works of God. Let's do a little review here. The blind man sees, he has sight through mud, God uses sin to show us his goodness and glory. Jesus does this miracle on the Sabbath. Only God can do such a miracle. But the scripture says that God doesn't work on the weekends. There's more. Those without sin, the religious folks, have seen since birth. They focus to see more. But they don't see a thing. The religious want it simple. They want to be able to take the bad things that happen and assign blame. In fact, they've already created their own explanations and lined up all the Bible passages to prove it, that they are right. They've got a pigeonhole for everyone and everything. If you've got a problem, you've had some misfortune in your life, they've got the recipe so that the world makes perfect sense. But of course, simple answers only go so far. Knowing, for instance, that sin causes blindness doesn't end suffering. Or knowing that a disease could have been prevented doesn't heal the afflicted. Knowing that ice caused a car to slide off a bridge doesn't fill the hole created when a mother loses her life. And that's why Jesus tells us, your ingredients aren't bread. Your answers don't work. The blind sees, the seen are blind. God's in charge of the mixing bowl. Go figure. Now I suppose I could make an attempt to explain all of this. Others before me have tried and I could take my turn at bat. We could spend hours creating our own recipes for what this all means. The results of such a study might even help to make the passage clear. But I think I will save that kind of examination for another time, because I believe there's something more important going on here. You see, when it comes to life, there's no getting around the fact that things don't always make sense. And when we're faced with such a world, it seems that the more we demand to see the more we ask questions and expect to know the answers, the more sightless and confused we become. So that we end up creating not a recipe for clarity, but we go further down into our questions, perplexity, and our anger, and our grief, and our despair. The more we demand to see, the more sightless we become. Once I did a funeral for a teenage girl. She was 17 years old, bright, pretty, popular, had her whole life in front of her. One Saturday morning, she was hit by a car, killed instantly. Why? Who was at fault? Was the driver drunk? 
What was she doing out on the road at that time anyway? Her classmates were in utter shock. They stayed up till all hours of the night replaying it in their minds. The father, worn with grief, kept coming and demanding to know, why did this have to happen to us? I must tell you, it made no more sense to me than it did to him. I noticed something that week. For all of our wrestling and questioning, the pain was not relieved, and the questions were not answered. In fact, as the week unfolded, the questions got bigger, the answers fewer, and the anguish more intense. The more we struggled to see, the more sightless we became. Sometimes, answers aren't enough. Oh yes, we could build a recipe that no one could challenge, the perfect set of true explanations, only to find that those ingredients don't mean a thing. The night before the funeral, I had a chance to talk with the mother. She said, Pastor, I don't know why this had to happen. Nothing makes sense anymore except one thing. I know that my little girl is safe in the arms of Jesus. I know that she is home. And then she said, I don't know why, but right now, that's about the only thing in the world that does make sense. That mother showed me something. Sight is not so much knowing as it is believing. Now some will claim to have the recipe. My friends, they are unsightly fools, for life's ways are hidden, riddles with nothing sure. Who can presume to know the mysteries and enigmas of our existence? Why? That is why I believe in the wonder and comfort of Jesus Christ, because sometimes, can't explain it, but sometimes he is the only thing in the world that makes sense. For he addresses the enigmas of life, not with our recipes of right answers, but with the greater mystery and riddle of himself. He says, in thirst there is water that quenches, in hunger there is bread to nourish. In sinfulness there is new birth, in blindness there is seen, in death there is life. And then he says, I am all these things. Amen.